Hi, I'm Adi Ignatius, Editor-in-Chief of the Harvard Business Review, and this is The New World of Work. On the show every week, we explore the future of work and all of its aspects and talk to leaders on the front lines about the challenges they're facing. So we have a great guest uh, this week. Uh, I will introduce her in a second. You'll notice we're not in studio. We're, we're at home. If you used to watch our predecessor show, HBR Quarantined, I'm quarantined. Uh, I tested for COVID. I'm fine, but I am at home and broadcasting from home and keeping a safe distance from everyone in the office. So anyway, I'll introduce our guests in a second, but first let's hear from our friends at Unisys. When you think about how the cloud can help your business, are you thinking big enough? We can help you drive more value from the cloud. We're Unisys and we do cloud really well. All right, so my guest today is Julie Sweet, the CEO of Accenture. She's been in that job for three years and last year additionally took on the role of chair. She brought a legal background to the job, having served as Accenture's general counsel, and before that as a partner at the law firm Cravath, Swain & Moore. Accenture has hundreds of thousands of employees and a lot of interesting approaches to talent development. So we're gonna talk about that and other things today. So Julie, welcome to the new world of work. Great. Thanks for having me, Adi. I'm excited to be here. Great. So let's jump right in. You have something like 700,000 employees at Accenture. So I'd love to hear about how you're thinking about winning the war for talent. And, you know, let's start with hiring. You know, what does it take to win the hiring wars these days? Well, that's a great question. And I think uh, hiring is the right place to start. When we think about talent, we actually think about how do you access talent? So how do you hire it? How do you become a creator of talent so that you don't always have to hire it? And then once they're here, how do you unlock the potential of talent? And uh, when you think about hiring, we've actually added to our workforce in the tightest labor history, a market in history, at least our history, uh, 200,000 people in the last 18 months. And uh, we've done so in, over that time, we've had 4.6 million uh, resumes. Uh, and so we use what's called a uh, high tech enabled high touch recruiting model. So we use technology to help us match the resumes with our needs. And our needs are really broad. For example, we have nurses and MDs as well as, you know, deep security professionals, as well as cloud professionals and people who do supply chain. So it's really, really broad talent um, that we seek. And, uh, and so we do so starting with, you know, this high tech enabled, high touch recruiting model, uh, which is kind of the how we do it. And of course, the the reason people come uh, is, you know, all about what we offer uh, our, our future employees. Um, so I have a lot of follow-ups there and there's a lot to unpack there. Let me just say to the audience watching this, um, I'm interviewing Accenture CEO, Julie Sweet. If you have questions for her, type them in and we'll try to get to some uh, viewer questions later. Um, so uh, I, a few places we could go. And, and I guess one is the question about skills. And as you said, you have different types of jobs that require different types of skills. But I have a feeling that... <clears throat> That both in what you're looking for or the algorithms you've created, there, there, there's some general skills or general attributes that people need these days. Can you talk about what you think those might be? You know, we'll, we'll see, let's just start with uh, one of the most important things that we look for. Actually, no matter you know who you are, is your ability to learn, learning agility, uh, because we know that while we may hire you for a certain set of skills the rate of change in the need for skills is quite rapid. So there's you know, lots of research on this, that skills that were around in the Fortune 500, for example, in 2017, that approximately 40% are no longer relevant. And so as we think about our own business, we start with learning agility and we ask a very simple question 
uh, to all of our applicants, senior and junior. Uh, those who are coming from school, we ask it slightly differently because um, they're in school. So what we'll say is, what have you learned in the last six months that was not part of school is what we add for those who are recruiting on campus. And what we're looking for are individuals who naturally learn things. Now, the answer could be, I learned to cook, right? The answer could be, I learned how to change a tire. The point is, can the applicant respond to that question? It's a really simple but very effective way of understanding whether you're hire, hiring someone who likes to learn. And, and actually one of our leadership essentials for all of our leaders is to lead with excellence, confidence, and humility. And the humility we find as a leadership quality is uh, what allows people to be natural learners and to build great teams. And so they're really connected when we think about uh, you know, the kinds of people and kinds of skills. Then you take a step back and we do think that digital literacy is absolutely critical. And so actually all of our 700,000 people, uh, regardless of where you sit, if you're, you know, working in our mail room, we still get mail, or, you know, you're on the front lines with our clients, uh, you have to go through something we call TQ. So it's your technology quotient where you take and have to pass assessments in 10 areas uh, because we really believe that basic technology skills are critical in every aspect. And that sort of links to the second area of talent that we focus on, which is being a creator of talent. Um, now, so, so reskilling in part, I guess, would mean making sure that people reach that, that general th threshold of whatever it is, digital literacy. Um, but at times you're doing, you know, pretty profound reskilling. And I'd love to hear, you know, again, because you have such a large workforce, what does what does reskilling look like at, at Accenture? Uh, well, let's take, let's go back to the pandemic in March of 2020. And when the pandemic hit, uh, there was a big shift online, as we all know. And all of a sudden we had incredible demand, for example, for uh, our clients to help them use you know, digital collaboration tools, which had to be implemented and then training of people. And there was far more demand than there was literally the day before the pandemic was declared. Uh, similarly, there was a big acceleration of the move to the cloud of needing cloud skills. And so what, Reskilling for Accenture looks like is we actually have a database of all our client facing people. We know what their skills are. We're able to use AI algorithms to identify who could be reskilled, what family of skills are close to what we have more demand on. And then we can actually do the reskilling. So, in the first six months after the pandemic, we upskilled about 100,000 people with programs that ranged from sort of eight to 15 weeks, depending on what we were upskilling them for. Uh, and we were able to do so very rapidly, which enabled us to emerge from the pandemic much faster because we could shift our people towards the new places of demand. And of course, it's part of what makes our um, Accenture such an attractive place to work because people feel like they're constantly being invested in. In fact, we spend about a billion dollars a year, an average of 40 hours per person of training, which is a you know really strong reason why we are able to recruit quarter in and quarter out such so amazing talent. So that's pretty interesting. So, so you know, normally you're, the deputy head of something and you're obviously a candidate to be the head of something but you know when you're talking about using ai to to figure out the 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 future possibilities you know they may not be so obvious or may not have been so obvious in the past can you talk a little bit more about that like like you know are there specific examples of where skills in one area actually translate into preparation for something else that we might not have thought about without without ai showing the way well, the easy examples are really 
um, examples that are around technical skills. So certain kinds of programming enable you to, you know, move more easily into other kinds of programming, uh, certain platforms. So for example, uh, if you're, you know, working on one kind of a cloud-based uh, platform, moving to another cloud-based platform are, are easier, but there's also um, more less obvious things. So for example, in security, uh, you know, the skills around security are very akin to what our professionals might be doing in risk and compliance because there's some deep analytical skills. And so those are the kinds of things where you might not have first looked at people doing risk or compliance for our clients to say, oh, yeah, they could easily become a security professional because, of course, security was that another area that was triggered um, high demand uh, when the pandemic hit. Uh, and yet the algorithm will identify uh, those who have those sort of deep analytical skills that are, are very useful in the security area. So those are the kinds of examples. And at the same time, it's not always the algorithms that do it, but also we actually can create skills. So for example, every part of every you know, business right now is being transformed by technology. But if you think about most of our clients, they don't, like someone maybe doing supply chain doesn't have necessary technology skills. They have the supply chain skills, but to really be able to transform it, you need more of those technology skills. Now we provide that for our clients. And so one of the things we have to do is to have both deep domain knowledge as well as technology skills. So We've in India, for example, this past year, we've recruited about, you know, really in the past six months, say 500 uh, leaders with deep domain knowledge, like in supply chain, with no technology knowledge. And then we've put them through a boot camp of eight to 12 weeks, depending on the domain, so that they can be working with our clients with the right domain knowledge, but also the technology skills. And so these are the kinds of things that we're doing with our clients. So you take someone like Chevron, uh, a leader in the energy field, fields, they know that technology is um, and digital is really transforming and will need to transform every part of their enterprise. And they partnered with us to create a school for them tailored to their different departments to teach already 20,000 people the digital skills they need to take their deep domain knowledge of working at Chevron and these departments, couple it with the right technology knowledge so that they can lead the reinvention uh, of their particular part of the company. And so it's really important to be sort of understanding uh, you know, what are the outcome that you need and what are the skills and can you um, educate and skill to get to those outcomes? And that's why when I talked about what companies need to do around talent, this idea of both accessing talent, but becoming a talent creator is also very, very important. Um, so I'm going to go to a, a, an audience question right now because it's it's pertinent. Um, and this is from Marilyn in Virginia. Um her question is, do you have, his or her question, do you have specific areas where you are experiencing skill shortages? And, you know, what are they? Are they functional? Are they industry-based? And if so, how are you addressing those? Well, uh, I, you know, it's a great question uh, that I think everyone is asking. Uh, and what I would say is that um, the we have a lot of what we call hot skills, so in-demand skills, and those range from uh, deep technology skills all the way to the industry and domain skills. I would say that we don't have a we don't have like a, a gap in the sense of our ability to hire. And part of that is that we do use technology to anticipate based on our demand, uh, even early stages, our knowledge of our skills our knowledge of who we could reskill or not reskill to anticipate. And so while I'm sure any of my leaders would say, I'm always in demand of skills, when you really look at, you know, are we able to hire for everything we are need, we can. But behind that uh, is a pretty sophisticated um, way of anticipating uh, the needs for skills. And of course, the technology to do that is really important. It's certainly important for Accenture, 
but it's also critical, you know, for our clients, it's driving a lot of our demand because it's hard to be able to predict and therefore make informed decisions about hiring or creating your own talent, unless you have a single source of truth around your employees. And so part of what's driving uh, the need for you know, new cloud-based solutions, which is a big part of our demand um, on the HR side, is this need to be much more sophisticated around your talent strategy, uh, which does start with technology, uh, and then if, if you want, we can later get into, you know, really the twin T's of trust and technology, because they do go hand in hand as you think about the changes you need to make in your organization to use technology effectively. So, again, if you have questions for, for Julie Sweet, please uh, type them into the, uh, the chat and we'll try to get to them soon. Thank you for those who put in the chat that they're wishing me a speedy recovery. I appreciate that. Um, I, I want to follow up on some of this, you know, when you're talking about. Um, you know about hiring and 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 you know pipelines and skills. Um, you know we're all we're all trying to diversify our workforces. Uh, a lot of us are coming to grips with the fact that we've not successfully diversified our workforces to the extent that we would like to. Um, and I guess there's a risk that the you know the algorithm will uh, exacerbate the problem rather than fix the problem. So I'd I'd love to hear how you you know you must be thinking about this a lot and and how you're trying to solve for diversity again, as you as you hire and, and maintain a workforce of 700,000 people. Well, great. I, I think um, maybe to start with, before I turn to diversity, your point around the algorithms can be, you know, a problem is I would point uh, the audience to a great um, body of work that uh, I actually helped lead at the U.S. Business Roundtable on Responsible AI, and uh, that is available on their website and talks about, and this came from cross-industry CEOs saying that it's really important that as companies, we have a roadmap to making sure that AI, which is so important from a competitiveness perspective, does get uh, deployed responsibly. And in fact, to that end when we were starting to deploy AI in some of the ways I've described to you, we first did a complete view and review of the different technologies that we had, how we were going to use AI so that we made sure that it was clear, it was transparent, there were guardrails, there was testing, uh, because you really can't re-engineer for responsible AI. You have to do it from the beginning. And so I just encourage uh, everyone and, and uh uh, to make sure they do have the right governance and that when they start to use these things that they are building in this idea of responsible AI, you know, from, from the beginning and not having a problem and then trying to, uh, to do it back going backwards. But, um, and that's, that's also important, not just for making sure that algorithms, you know, work well when you do things like match resumes with jobs, um, but, you know, for other uses as well. Now, with respect to diversity, it's a huge focus of ours. Uh, we have committed to being, uh, by 2025, reaching gender parity. We have very specific goals around racial and ethnic diversity in the countries where we're allowed to set them. Uh, we have a broad view of diversity uh, that includes persons with disabilities, uh, veterans, uh, LGBTQI. And so all of those um, uh, goals are treated like business priorities. So just like business priorities, they start with data and they start with making sure that we um, use the data to inform not just goal setting, but tracking progress. And uh, I think that's a really important uh, part of what you need to do uh, to be committed. And so we look at that very carefully to make sure we have very diverse pools, for example, when we're doing hiring, because you can't get to your numbers if you haven't a broad enough hiring pools. Um, talk, talk more about that. I mean, so, so, you know, I know that you have explored, you know, dropping certain requirements, degrees, uh, you know, things like that, that once would have been you know, just what you did. And and now, you know, thinking more broadly, I, you know, I, I think you have an apprenticeship program in this area too. I, I'd love to hear more specifics about, you know, how, how you're trying to tackle this. 
Well, it's starting in North America, although we've now done this globally with respect to skills, is we re-looked at our job requirements. And so, for example, in North America, about 48, nearly 50 percent of our uh, job openings do not require four-year degrees. And they used to all require four-year degrees. And so that immediately opens you up to a broader pool of people that you can um, hire from. And in fact, about 20 percent of the people we actually hire for those openings do not have four year degrees. So we've expanded the pool of people who we can go after to fill these jobs. At the same time, we've explored other ways of both um, expanding our access to talent, making a positive impact on our employees. I mean, on our communities and also um, creating a more diverse workforce. And we've done that through the apprenticeship program. So it started actually when I became the CEO of North America uh, in the U.S. Um, back in 2015. I looked at we had this amazing program called Skills to Succeed, where we were skilling people in the community, but we weren't actually hiring people at Accenture. And so we started with seven apprentices in Chicago. And we've now, since 20, um, we, and that program started actually in 2016, we've now had over 1,200 apprentices go through our program. We hire most of them. We have incredible retention. And 20% of our hiring in the U.S., our entry-level hiring in the U.S., will be through our um, apprenticeship program, which is about 50-50 men and women, uh, about nearly 60% uh, or more racially or ethnically diverse, and all almost all come from very uh, challenged socioeconomic backgrounds. And these are individuals who would not have been on a path to get a job at Accenture using um, kind of our old uh, way of hiring because we had to think out of the box and really uh, look at skills and potential and then be willing to train ourselves. So that kind of comes back to that need to be a talent creator. And I would tell you, um, it's a huge win because these are some of our best employees, great retention, um, great learners. Uh, and of course, they've opened up terrific new pathways for them. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit, and you know this may be to, to the surprise of of uh, some of our viewers, but you know Accenture is often mentioned as you know a leader in this, the kind of corporate applications of the metaverse. So I'd love to hear you talk about what does the metaverse do for Accenture. Well, great. So we're really excited about the metaverse. Uh, we just put our tech vision out called the Metaverse Continuum. So if you haven't read it please take a look at it. We think the metaverse is as impactful as the tech vision that we did back in 2013 when we said that every business would be a digital business, uh, which has definitely come true a decade later. And we think the metaverse um, is that significant in terms of what it'll do for the next decade. And this year we will onboard about 150,000 people uh, by going through Accenture's metaverse called One Accenture Park, which we think is the largest enterprise metaverse uh, in the world. Uh, it used a beta version of Enmesh by Microsoft. And uh, what it does is it brings together people who've joined Accenture in the metaverse to explore Accenture, to have a shared experience with other new joiners when we're still not having in-person shared experiences. And our research shows that immersive learning for short sprints, so not all day in the metaverse, this is about a 30 minute experience, is actually more impactful. Uh, it's been extraordinarily well received uh, by our people who are onboarding, who find it uh, both learning, but also it creates bonds of these shared experiences with other people who are going through it. So I just took my board um, uh, through it just recently, and uh, they absolutely loved it. It's super innovative. And if you're an innovative company and you're trying to show that innovation, then there's no better way than introducing your company to new joiners through some of the most cutting edge technology. So, so I've, I, I can imagine what you're talking about, but for, for, for viewers who may think, you know, okay, I don't get this. I really don't get what the metaverse is. T talk a little bit about, you know, what is the experience? What are, what are, sure. what are people doing? What are they seeing? How are they interacting in ways that, 
they wouldn't be just by, let's say, the conversation that, that we're having like this. Great. So instead of like just looking at each other and having someone explain, well, here you're going to learn about TQ and uh, here are the different things that our services do. Uh, instead, uh, when you join Accenture, someone will take you through building your own avatar, which you get to do yourself. You'll put on uh, some glasses. Some people do it in 2D. Most, most use glasses um, and do it in 3D. And when you step into the metaverse, you're literally with, say, 30 other people who are also on their first or second day at Accenture. You start by talking to them. They like get you familiar with how you move around. And if you've had a metaverse experience, you actually, it's like going to a cocktail party where you only hear the people near you. You don't hear the people far away. So there's 30 people, say, in the experience. You're not hearing 30 people talk at once. You're actually talking to people just as if you were in person uh, next to them. Uh, then we explore, we you know, take you to different parts of the metaverse. So for example, you'll go to an area where you learn about our TQ training and you can tap on something and it'll actually immerse you in, hey, this is what you're gonna learn. And you'll actually see it. It'll then take you to other parts of Accenture. So we have an innovation lab in San Francisco and you'll actually go to, in our metaverse, there's an identical replica of that. So you get to go experience and say, hey, this is what it's gonna look like when you're there. Here's what we have. You can touch buttons and see the actual, ex you know, um, uh, different example things like drones, et cetera, that we have in some of our uh, things. And so it basically brings to life in 3D you know, the world and you're doing it with people all over the world. So you're beginning to have these shared experiences. You're talking, you're able to react with the people standing next to you. You're able to ask them questions like, Oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm going to do this. Uh, and so it's literally as if you've been taken someplace physically and are experiencing it with in many ways, the ways we used to do onboarding because people did come to offices and they would get to experience things. And at the time we might take them on teams to another innovation hub, but they really get to experience it. We're also doing client visits in the same way. And so I stood up um, you know, with 30 clients in our innovation hub entirely in the metaverse, uh, showed them, you know, 3D examples of the things that we have there uh, as if they were actually sitting and getting to see it. It's, it's super powerful. And we've been doing this since uh, doing sort of the underlying technology since 2007. And I will tell you, I joined Accenture in 2010. And I remember my first, you know, technology showcase, which we would have at all our internal leadership meetings. And I remember putting on glasses for the first time and I was a lawyer and I've like, this will never make sense. And back then it was super clunky. It wasn't real. It is amazing if you haven't experienced it, what technology does today. And, you know, we're working on it to do everything from onboarding experiences and doing training. It is Literally, for a, if you're a retail or any consumer facing, it will be just another way to engage. Like, um, we're overwhelmed by demand right here because now leading brands all believe they have to have a metaverse customer engagement. And then, even um, maybe even more exciting is how it's going to be used to actually run the enterprise, like the work we're doing with Mars, where uh, there's digital twins that we're building around their production sites and then going from the digital twin to the actual site, um, making changes and sort of sort of part physical, part digital. Uh, it's, it's really going to be transformative uh, in the way that you work uh, and the way that you engage with each other. And the technology is only going to get better. I mean, it, we've spent a lot of time this season talking about, you know, dispersed work versus being in office, how many days. And, you know, this is something else entirely. And, and it, it, it almost seems like that question could seem quaint if the if the experiences are so I, I don't know in, engaging that uh, it will blur what we thought was the value of the in person experience. I, I almost question myself as I say that sentence, but that's sort of the inevitable um, place to end up, right? Yeah, I, I, I would say that we will always have physical and digital, and that's the power of. Um, you know, the future is that 
it's not all physical or all digital, it's the mix. And to your point, the technology is at very early stages. And so while we've been literally experimenting and using the underlying technologies going all the way back to 2007, and while the comparison from then to now is amazing, we're just getting started. And there's a ton of technology developments that need to occur um, until we really can be operating uh, in, the, in, a, in the metaverse in a persistent way across platforms in your personal and professional life. And at the same time, what I would say is the future is, we sometimes call it fidgetal, physical and digital. Uh, and it's just at the ease of going in between those worlds and using the digital worlds and technology to augment connections, relationships, and productivity will remain the goal as opposed to digital being the destination. I mean, a, a fully virtual being the de destination. Yeah. So I want to I want to ask another question from our viewers, and this is from Adna in Brunei. So you know, people are people are listening closely to what you're saying about about skill sets and hiring. So Adna's question is: In your personal opinion, what would be the most essential skill sets that graduating students should equip themselves with? Uh, technology literacy, and what I mean by that is. Uh, you need to treat computer science like reading, not that you need to ever be a programmer, but you have to have experienced it. Uh, you know, you need to have basic knowledge about what is the cloud, what is AI, and some of the best schools really are creating technology curriculums that are not intended to graduate a technologist, so someone who's actually gonna either program or build technology, but to build technology literacy. And until then, you know, really, you know, sort of curating your own program so that if you're graduating, you understand, you have basic um, understanding of um, these skills are, are really important. Here's another question. This is from Steve in California. Um, and it gets to the sort of full-time employees versus gig workers. You know, do you find that you're using more freelancers as part of your workforce as a way to access the, you know, the, the hot skills that you need? You know, we are not. Uh, and so um, our employees, we, we don't really use the gig economy at scale. That may be something that we do in the future. It's uh, in, in large part because of the, you know, sort of demand that we have, the needs for security, uh, the, you know, the training that goes on. It's harder to, for us, um, we haven't found it that productive to do a lot with the gig economy. Certainly many of our clients are successfully accessing those skills. Uh, but so I think it's going to depend on the industry uh, and the kinds of demand uh, that they have, um, as you can imagine, for us are, you know, because we create skills and the skills change a, a lot and we have that ability, uh, we're not sort of dabbling it sort of in and out. So we haven't really had a big use yet of the gig economy. So this is from Manuela in Frankfurt. What role do soft skills play in your hiring process? And do you consider soft skills as the new hard skills? Uh, it's a great uh, phrase, and I think that uh, soft skills were um, always a hard skill in our view, and it goes back to sort of that view about leadership. We certainly um, ask a lot about how people uh, think about, for example, leaders coming in, about how they lead people, which are, are soft skills. Uh, and so soft skills are absolutely important, such as communication skills, and in fact, when we were trying to expand our ability to hire more women into technical jobs, because we can do so much training, we actually have gone to, for example, liberal arts schools and hired in more people with great critical thinking skills, really good soft skills, and then train them on the technology. Uh, and so I certainly uh, think that soft skills are absolutely critical and they're an important part of, um, of the interviewing process. Mm -hmm. So here's one from Siva or Shiva in New York City, who notes that it is Mental Health Awareness Month. And the question is, what steps do organizations need to take to improve the mental health of their employees? One of the, I think, big benefits, uh, which it's hard to say that because the pandemic was so difficult, but I think 
there has been in the corporate world, at least a, re a real focus on mental health that I believe will, will continue. And uh, we, we have a leadership essential called um, caring for your people personally and professionally and mental health is it certainly an important part of that. Uh, and so I think as organizations understanding, you know, do you offer the right benefits? Do you, um, you know, doing listening for your people in terms of uh, what they think they need around mental health and then having a strategy around it. And so if you're a leader in a company and you can't say, here's how we are uh, working on um, making sure that we are helping the mental health of our employees, then it probably is a signal that you're not doing enough. One of the things we're really proud of is a partnership that we have with Thrive, Ariana Huffington's um, company, where we've had over 180,000 people complete a mental um, wellness uh, computer and science-based program. Uh, it's It's been the most probably successful program that we provided our employees. The, the numbers grow each um, each week because it does have really good results in terms of helping people be less anxious and feel more able to um, care for themselves. Uh, and so the big question in my mind is, do you know what your strategy is? We just hired a chief health officer. And one of the things that uh, she does look after is ensuring that we've got the right strategy and execution of that strategy. So this might be the, the last question that we that we take, but I, I want to ask you, um, you know, you've been lauded as one of the most powerful women in business. You know, there are, of course, many other celebrated female CEOs of big companies, but there's still clearly an underrepresentation of top women, you know, of women at the top in business. So what's your view? How, how will that change? I think there's so much room for hope, not just optimism, because the fact is that it is changing. I remember when I became CEO back in 2019, it was uh, shortly around when Indira uh, stepped down at PepsiCo and there was this, this huge limitation uh, lament because she was so um, so much a role model for all of us. And it seemed like we were moving backwards. And since then, there have been so many exceptional women, uh, you know, Karen Lynch at CVS, Roz Brewer at Walgreens, Jane Frazier at City, Sonia uh, Siegel at uh, Gap. Like the, the list goes on and on, actually, which is really nice. Uh, and, you know, TIAA, uh, you know, just the, the list is great. And uh, so I think there's a lot of hope. And what you're starting to see is that the work that's been done to create a pipeline of CEOs is starting to happen as there's generational change. So I think it's good to end perhaps on uh, my, you know, on a hopeful note is that I do believe that uh, there's a ton of reason for hope. And I see so many great women uh, continuing to rise in companies. And that's what you need, right? You need a pipeline in order for it to be at the top. All right. Well, that is a good that is a good place to end. There were tons of tons more audience questions. I wish we could get to them. But that was a great discussion, Julie. Thank you for being on The New World of Work. Thank you so much, Adi. It was great to be here. And thanks for all the great questions from the audience. All right. So that was Julie Sweet, the CEO of Accenture. Uh, our guest next week will be Daniel Lamar, the former president and CEO of Cirque du Soleil, the Canadian entertainment circus company. Uh, Daniel recently stepped down after two decades in those roles, and he still serves as Cirque du Soleil's executive vice chairman. He's also the author of the new book, Balancing Acts, Unleashing the Power of Creativity in Your Life and Work. So that will be at the usual time next Wednesday, May 11th at 12 noon uh, Eastern time. I want to thank all of you who uh, are watching. If you like this stuff, uh, please sign up for our newsletter. Go to hbr.org slash newsletters, and you can sign up for the New World of Work newsletter. Again, thank you for, for being with us. I'm Adi Ignatius. This is the New World of Work.